Okay. So, all right. Okay. So we're going to for the next few lectures we're going to look at uh, a, a fundamental area of uh, data, data loss uh, prevention. So just on the radio today, there was a, a, a quote. I think it says, uh, "Security is essential, and privacy is desirable." Okay. So that's one side of, of the debate. So uh, we are technologists. And it's really up to us to be able to articulate the technology. We're not politicians, uh, but we need to understand the, the issues uh, in, involved and to be able to articulate what's possible and what isn't possible. So we'll be having a look at, at some of the areas of data loss prevention, to look at how we can detect large-scale data loss and some of the motivations behind uh, how data loss can actually happen. So we'll look at the, the Sony hack in some detail and see if we can see the, the timeline of that, what happened when and how it could have possibly been, uh, been uh, avoided. So just now what we see is that virtually every week we see uh, a new hack, new large scale data loss. Uh, it's happened at Home Depot with credit cards, it also happened with Target. Uh, something like 50 odd million, 50 to 70 million credit card details uh, were taken from the point of sales within the stores. So everything was secure in the back end, but in the front end someone put a little bit of malware on the point of sale devices and it was able to skim off the credit card details and the, the, uh, the CVS uh, number too. So with these credit cards being sold on Raptor, uh, .cc for about $50 a shot for a high quality, uh, high value credit card. You can see there's a lot of money for someone uh, there to, uh, to to make. So we see lots, lots of uh, lots of threats increasingly. We saw the Adobe uh, hack where it was about 50 odd million uh, passwords were were actually uh, taken from them. And then we see things like uh, the ghost. And then there was skeleton, the Dell Secure Works skeleton uh, hack. And then we had the iWorm, which wasn't really a, a worm. Uh, it was actually a Trojan, backdoor Trojan. People downloaded uh, uh, their Photoshop for the Mac from Pirate Bay. And obviously if you download it from Pirate Bay, you're getting a whole lot of backdoors and Trojans and things like that. Uh, so they were really asking for trouble. There was nothing special on a Mac. A Mac is a Linux machine, a Mac is a server actually, you can run a lot more services uh, and it's just as open as a, as a Windows device. It just happens that it hasn't been targeted as much uh, as, as Windows because there's, there's less of them uh, around. But there's nothing to stop uh, anyone, as we see for our Linux stuff, to be able to install services and, and things like that. And people tend not to be running uh, the virus scanner. And then we saw with the, uh, the Dark Hotel, in the Far East, where executives were targeted uh, when they went to this hotel for uh, 18 months or so, and the hackers were basically throwing everything they could at these individuals. We had of the Freak, Freak's not new, uh, Freak is, is the cracking of 512-bit RSA keys, which really isn't that difficult. If you can find the public key of 512, then on the cloud, you can reverse it back find the private key that's associated with the public key. That's why we use 2048-bit RSA keys, because 512-bit have been cracked uh, a, a while back. So, and they did that by sending Adobe updates that were signed by Adobe, so they managed to reverse the key back, the private key, so they could sign the, the Adobe updates for your flash or for your browser, and they could actually push them to it. With Freak, what happens is that you step the browser back, we'll go into panels, so later on in the module we'll go into tunnels and the detail of how a tunnel is, is set up. But with, a, with, a, with the freak, basically steps the security level down enough under the radar so that the keys can be cracked. Okay? So we'll have a look at tunneling and what tunneling does. Because tunneling is the ultimate in data loss. If something tunnels, then you're in danger of large scale data loss. Okay, so we see these things happening all the time, and it's almost like every day, every week, there's a, there's a, there's a new threat. And we could look at uh, some of the examples. So uh, uh, one of the most recent ones was uh, Bradley Manning, 
who's now Chelsea, uh, Manning. And uh, Chelsea, Chelsea was a low-level uh, operative really in the uh, uh, in, in the US uh, 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 defence, uh, and managed to take a CD off, off site. So it seems quite a crude method now, but that was quite a high-tech method, was to, to dump stuff onto a CD and then just walk out. <coughs> it's very difficult to detect a CD, uh, leaving a, a, a site and, and, and so on. And then we had uh, Julian uh, Assange, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of, uh, of WikiLeaks. Uh, he went to the Ecuadorian uh, embassy, uh, I think he's still, still yep. there, still there, uh, in London. Uh, and uh, there's a complicated history around just the possible criminal activities that are not related <coughs> to his, his leaking of information, uh, but it's certainly been pinpointed uh, as, a, as, a, as a danger uh, to by, by, by some, uh, some people. Okay. <coughs> and then uh, there was uh, Ed Snowden, who, who was a trusted contractor. One thing we'll see through the presentation today is that trusted contractors uh, and insiders are a much greater threat than external uh, People and the more, if someone is in your company, they're behind your firewall uh, and they can do lots of things, especially if they have sysadmin uh, access. So he worked for Dell and had trusted access to the systems with inside uh, the, the NSA. The rights of citizens, the future of the internet. So I'd like to welcome to the TED stage I the man behind those revelations, this. Ed Snowden. It is uh, in a remote location somewhere in Russia, uh, controlling the spot with, from his laptop. So he can see what the bot can see. Ed, welcome to the TED stage. What, what can you see, as a matter of fact? <laughs> I can see everyone. This is amazing. <laughs> um, I want to do that. I want to do that. Some questions for you. You've been called many things in the last few months. You've been called uh, a whistleblower, uh, a traitor, a hero. What words would you describe yourself with? You know, we, everybody who's involved with this debate has been struggling over me and my personality and, and what, how to describe me. But when I think about it, these, these, this isn't a question that we should be struggling. Who I am really doesn't matter at all. If I'm the worst person in the world, you can hate me and, and move on. What really matters here are the issues. What really matters here is the kind of government we want, the kind of internet we want, the kind of relationship between people and societies. And that's what I'm hoping the debate will move towards, and we've seen that increasing over time. If I had to describe myself, I wouldn't use words like hero, I wouldn't use patriot, and I wouldn't use traitor. I'd say I'm an American and I'm a citizen, just like everyone else. Hmm. So just to give some context for those who don't know the whole, the whole story. This time, um, this time uh, a year ago, you were stationed in Hawaii working as a consultant to the NSA. You had, as a sysadmin, you had access to their systems. Um, and you began um, reviewing certain classified documents with some hand-picked journalists um, leading the way to June's revelations. Now, what propelled you to do this? You know, when I was sitting in Hawaii, uh, and the years before when I was working in the intelligence community, I saw a lot of things that had disturbed We do a lot of good things in the intelligence community, things that need to be done and things that help everyone. But there are also things that go too far. There are things that shouldn't be done, and decisions that were being made in secret, without the public's awareness, without the public's consent, and without even our representatives in government having knowledge of these programs. When I really came to struggle with these issues, I thought to myself, how can I do this in the most responsible way that maximizes the public benefit while minimizing the risks. And out of all the solutions that I could come with, 
out of going to Congress when there was no laws, there were no legal protections for a, a private employee, a contractor in intelligence like myself, there was, there was a risk that I would be buried along with the information and the public would never find out. But the First Amendment of the United States Constitution guarantees us free press for a reason. And that's to enable an adversarial press to challenge the government, but also to work together with the government, to have a dialogue and debate about how we can inform the public about matters of vital importance without putting our national security at risk. And by working with journalists, by giving all of my information back to the American people, rather than trusting myself to make the decisions about publication, we've had a robust debate with a deep investment by the government that I think has resulted in a benefit for, for everyone. Okay, so that, that's one side of, of the debate. We had Edward Snowden here uh, a couple of days ago, and um, this is response time. Um, and several of you have written to me with, uh, with questions to ask um, our guest here from the NSA. So Richard Ledger is the 15th Deputy Director of the National Security Agency, um, and um, he's a senior civilian officer there, acts as its chief operating officer, guiding strategies, setting internal policies, and um, serving as the principal advisor to the director. And all being well, um, welcome Rick Ledger to TED. Thank you, Rick. We appreciate you joining us. It's, a, it's certainly quite a strong statement that the NSA is willing to reach out and show a more open face here. Um, you saw, I think, the uh, talk and interview that uh, Edward Snowden gave you a couple of days ago. What did you make of it? So I think um, uh, it, was, it was interesting. It was, uh, we didn't realize that, uh, that he was going to show up there. So uh, uh, kudos to you guys for uh, for arranging a nice surprise like that. Um, I think uh, uh, I think that like a lot of the things that have uh, have come out since uh, since Mr. Snowden started uh, disclosing uh, classified information, there were there were some um, some kernels of truth in there, but a lot of uh, ex uh, extrapolations and half truths in there, and I'm interested in uh, helping you address those. Uh, I think this is a really important conversation that we're having in the United States and internationally, and I think uh, it is it is important and of import, and so given that, we need to uh, have that be a fact-based conversation, and we want to help make that happen. Okay, so you can see that the two, the two ends of the spectrum there, so it's a, a big debate, it's probably one of the most fundamental debates we're having as a society just now. Uh, some would want to listen to all the email and communications and so on. As we see from a technology point of view, it's actually quite difficult to, to make that happen, uh, but really society needs to understand whether it should be listening to communications, uh, or whether it should respect privacy. So it depends what side uh, of the debate uh, that society is willing to take. India has just ruled uh, that uh, email communications uh, from cloud providers is actually banned. Uh, so we can see that governments are, are finding quite a difficult time to balance the, the, two, the two things up. Okay, so we'll, we'll try and understand really some of the background be behind uh, some of the motivations that can actually lead to a large scale uh, data, data loss. So probably one of the best ones to look at is really Sony because Sony goes back a long, 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 long way. People just think it kicked off at Christmas time there. It, it's not. It's been happening and evolving for, for a long, long time. And really where we need to start is possibly here. We need to start at the, at the start and the end there. We need to understand the threats. Who are the threat actors? Where are they? And we need to also look at the, the motivations. Why is it that somebody wants to steal information from us? What's the motivation? <coughs> is it money? Uh, is it prestige? What is the motivation? Because if we don't understand that, then we're never going to uh, understand how we can actually protect our key assets, 
which is our people and our, our data. And increasingly, the data is the company. If we don't protect that, then uh, you can be in, in great danger of loss of intellectual property, loss of patient records, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a careful balance. And increasingly, industry is putting in place mechanisms to detect at least uh, that something is, is going on. Okay, so we need to understand who it is, where they are, and what the objectives uh, are. That's the start and the end of our security uh, instruments. And if you look at the if you look at the <coughs> top ten of all time, Heartland One was the number one hundred and fifty million uh, credit card. Hundred and fifty million credit card uh, details were, were taken from that. The company still exists, still one of the top six companies for credit card payments in the whole world. Uh, so they survived uh, it, but it can really damage the, the brand greatly uh, for that. Then there was a whole lot of other ones. Sony was 77 million, as we'll see, uh, just in a little while. And then Sony are in there again. HMRC happened in the UK, where CDs were sent, non-encrypted CDs, and it still happens. Just a few weeks ago, uh, the Department of Justice in the UK sent out CDs to solicitors non-encrypted uh, and non and non-protected posts. You should never trust the mail system ever. There are so many people involved in the chain, so many eyes, so many people have the opportunity. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but on several occasions I've lost money. People have sent me posts. Has it ever happened to anyone here? I've got nobody that sent money to me. What's that? Said nobody will send money to All right. so Okay, no, nobody uh, trust, probably trusts it in, anymore. So if it's secure, always electronic and always encrypted uh, and so on. Don't don't put it in the mail, even though it's recorded delivery and, and it's a it's a, it's a, a delivery and service. Just, just don't trust that. Okay, so so our case study is really going to look at uh, a kind of well known brand. see what happened uh, in there. So if we look at the, the basic history of uh, Sony, you could really trace the, the problems that they've had back uh, to the time of uh, George Holtz. So George Holtz uh, was the one who, who broke the, uh, the, the, the iPhone and then went on to break the PlayStation. Uh, uh, PlayStation published the, the private keys uh, for for, uh, All right, our next guest is getting quite a bit of attention this afternoon. That is because he has managed to figure out how to replace the AT&T chip in an Apple iPhone, which means, of course, you can use your uh, iPhone on another network. George Hotz of Glen Rock, New Jersey, joins us now. And it is so great to see you in person because it's amazing what you have done. Um, what, what way did you decide to decide you were going to be the one who's going to hack into the iPhone? I didn't even like, I didn't decide that. I just wanted a, I first bought the iPhone. I was at a shopping mall with my friend who had three hours outside an Apple store. And you really wanted one. I really wanted one. I mean, he had AT&T, so he went home. He was like, I can call people on my iPhone. And I was like, I have a team of like, I can't really call people on my iPhone. So I was like, I'm going to unlock the iPhone. And oh, so that you could use the iPhone so on use, your family, do you have a T-Mobile exactly. or something? Though? We have a T-Mobile family plan and those termination fees are insane and those, the AT&T charges an extra $20 a month for iPhone customers, so no. Let's just make it work with T-Mobile. Okay, well, I might have thought that myself too, but then I wouldn't have uh, gone to the, uh, I wouldn't have the ability to do what you did. Uh, okay, there you are on YouTube. Everyone's gonna be watching that. I think you're talking to everyone. So so here is uh, what looks to me to be a, a ripped up iPhone. Well, I, um, well, first of all, I'd also like to say, if it was really just about the AT&T, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done it. If it were really just about using it with T-Mobile, I wouldn't have done it, but this was fine. 
this was this is a good use of a song. I like I became obsessed with unlocking this. It thing. was fun. So yeah, the uh, okay. this is actually the inside here of an yeah. iPhone, and um, you can see. These two wires right here are the test point, mm -hmm. which I discovered that you have to short them together and then run some software. These you can barely see on air, everyone. They're kind of on the top of my They're like here. Super small wires. You just uh -huh. connect them together and run some software and get your iPhone unlocked. Yeah. Okay, so, so all right. And, and then there's this is the chip card here. So you, you pulled this apart yeah, this and figured the, it out. This is the SIM card okay. right here. You just, that's just a T Mobile one. Okay, so here, here, here's the thing. Today we've got Apple shares up, and I think you're saying you might be the reason. Two and a half percent. I don't know. I mean, more people want iPhones now if they can use them with any sort of provider. Right, and you and you are you're telling me right now you're ready to call out uh, Mr. Jobs. I would love to have a talk right now with Steve Jobs. Man to man. Man to man. That's kind of. Steve like. Jobs, this is the call out. We're, we're, we're telling you because you haven't talked to him yet. You haven't Something talked to AT&T. None anymore. of them have called you. No, I haven't had any contact with any companies iPhone related at all. No one's no no lawsuits. Nothing. Well, this is completely legal actually. Um, covered under the DMCA uh, um, since November 2006. So well, the Digital Millennium Cellular some, the Copyright Act. Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that's the one, yes. Um, cellular telephone unlocking and the reverse engineering required to do the cellular telephone unlocking is completely legal. Hmm. So. I wonder what AT&T thinks about that. All right, let me ask you what your parents thought. I mean, did you have a job this summer or did you literally just do literally, this? Literally, I worked on the iPhone. There were nights I was going to sleep at 9 in the morning and waking up at 4 in the afternoon. Just and, to do this? <clears throat> yeah. And, and, all right, and here's the other thing I want to ask you. You could have sold. This code, this code to unlock this was, was very lucrative, but you're not. You put it, you, you posted it for free on yeah. the internet. Like, that's what I really believe in. I really believe that information should be free. And I tried to make the method as simple as possible for everyone to follow. I mean, the only way, uh, I'm never going to even unlock iPhones for people. I put this world second unlocked iPhone here. On There's eBay. only two. This is the second. This one's on eBay. And this I is think the first one, which I keep in my pocket. And this is the second one. Um, and... Other than that, I have no plans of making any money off of this, and if I find an easier way to unlock the iPhone, I'll post it on my blog. Okay, so you so went ahead and uh, you, you cracked the, the private keys for, for the PlayStation Network, and then Sony went af after them. Sony also tried to get access to his PayPal, PayPal account, which I think was, was allowed, uh, and uh, they requested from the social media all the accesses to the... To, uh, to his, to his channel, uh, for, for his website, and also on YouTube. Anybody who made comments on his YouTube channel uh, was also requested. Uh, YouTube said no and, and didn't actually uh, uh, allow it. So you've got to be very careful about what you actually post online because it could come back and bite you sometime in the future. And the internet is a lot less anonymous than it, than it actually used to be. So luckily for him, uh, well, they also wanted the IP addresses of everybody who accessed his, his website. They settled out of court because they obviously didn't want the bad press, but they were, he was told not to hack any more Sony products uh, from there. But really that was, that was the start of, of the problem. So uh, it upset Anonymous and they went. So what did you do to protect your privacy? Do you protect your privacy? Or which, which kind of uh, I, as a professor, it's very difficult to you have a public persona. As long as you're fair and honest, and uh, you, you don't have an agenda, I, I'm a technologist, yeah. I'm not a politician. Uh, I might believe in some things, but I have a vote. But as a professor, I've got to be as fair as we should all be. Uh, we should always articulate the technology and tell people that that's possible and not, and not possible. Uh, so it's very difficult for an academic to really not have a public profile. I don't use Facebook very much, but I can see the benefits of LinkedIn uh, and, and so on. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. It's a scary world, but it's also a world of opportunity. Okay, so uh, Anonymous went after them and, and there was a, a denial of service. Uh, uh, focused on the on the GeoHot uh, lawsuit, and the PlayStation Network went 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 offline. After that, uh, there was a large scale breach. As we've seen, uh, 77 million credit card details were taken from the, from the Sony PlayStation Network, and they announced that week uh, that they that they were safe. Unfortunately, the week later, 
I'm back in again Oof. with uh, 24.6 million credit card details again. So just watch when your company says that everything is fine and okay, and so make sure that you have closed all the back doors and, and so on, and you know your company before you, you actually tell the world that everything is fine, because you could be uh, severely uh, embarrassed. Um, who um, covers um, your US Right, our next guest is getting quite... So, so the, uh, the money lost you would have due to the fact that somebody hacked your yeah. credit card too covers us. It's company, isn't it? It's yeah. Sony. There's, there's litigation lawyers now that will do uh, class actions and they will say anybody who wants to, to, to sue the company will go after them or we'll just, we just estimate how many. 10% of uh, people in Target will say roughly they'll, they'll get in contact and we'll claim the money first and give it back to them. Yeah. So more and more litigation lawyers are getting involved in these things. And these can be the, the largest losses. But individuals can go after the companies and, uh, and can obviously go to Visa if there's a loss. But loss of stress is, is just as bad uh, a loss. Uh, losing time in work, having to trace up your credit card and cancelling and things like that. Taking your kids out of school, losing their education, uh, it just goes on and on. Uh, and, and who's to know that somebody in the future doesn't uh, abuse your credit card? So, the, I, I'll, go, I'll go into losses in, in, in a little minute. Okay, so, so that happened to, to Sony and, uh, and things got a whole lot worse uh, after that. So the problem is that uh, at the time they didn't really understand uh, SQL injection. So standard SQL is that, that's a PHP script that many people use. Uh, it will take from a text box, admin and pass and, and it'll feed the variables in. So we, we have, if you put an admin and password, that's the SQL statement that goes in there. SQL is, is still the most widely used technology in the industry, it's used everywhere. Unfortunately, at the time, nobody told them about that uh, by feeding in a password of or one equals one uh, uh, hyphen. Uh, basically, short circuits the SQL command makes everything true, so that the whole of the, the table, the whole of the database, is actually viewed. Uh, no one <laughs> really at that time it, it, it wasn't well known a well known fact. The other thing that they didn't do was that uh, so we've all hopefully covered salt, so we should all know how to salt now. That's the salt in there. We take a password and we salt it a little bit, it makes it more difficult uh, to actually determine it. And at that time, Sony hadn't salted their passwords. In fact, they hadn't even hashed their passwords in, in, in some cases. So we actually look at what happened. The share price, you can see, dropped just after the, after the hack and kept it kept dropping. So you can see there, it was back online, everything looked okay, and then it, it dipped again. There are a whole lot of people making money on the stock market uh, for security hacks. If you can find out early that there's going to be an announcement that a company's been hacked, then uh, people in the stock market will bail out the stock like anything, and then get back in once it goes back, because it'll go back up. Okay, a little glitch, a day or two, and then it'll go back up. But the stock market will react to it and it will reduce. So there's money to be made and it happened with Heartbleed. I'll go over Heartbleed in a bit more detail later on. Heartbleed, five days before the hack well, it was announced, it wasn't a hack, it was a bug, it was announced, people started bailing out a large scale of Yahoo, who was the main company involved in it. So there are whispers that happen in the security community, people tell people that something's going to kick off. We see them all the time. We see people announcing things before they actually happen. Uh, so you might see it on a day, but we've many people have known about it for a week uh, or, or so. So you can see there it can affect, and you can see the shares that are traded there. There's a lot of bailing in and bailing out of, of shares that actually happen uh, from that. Okay, so it can really affect the, the, the shareholding of the, of, of the company. So this is really what happened, the, the basic timeline, and, and this is just a small section of what, what happened uh, overall. So there was a, a leak uh, on, on Google uh, from, from that, and then uh, basically intruders went through the Sony sites from, from many places and used standard SQL injection 
we can see there Greece uh, and uh, uh, the Japanese uh, site there, and also the Sony Epson, which is obviously a, a, a part of the, the Sony network. And then, just one by one, Belgium, uh, and Portugal, France, and so on, all with SQL injections. So if a breach happens in your company, you react to it. If you get one case of SQL on one of your sites, you make sure that you go around all the other sites and all your trusted partners, and you make sure that SQL injection is actually detected. So in this case, we can see we're going from May to the end of June, and SQL injection is still working in each of the sites. And obviously, Sony is a big company. It's, it's disparate across the world. It has lots of different IT systems and so on. That's your challenge that, that you have is to protect this. Your core data center is lovely. It's all secure and stuff like that. It's the stuff at the outside of your network. It's the peripheral stuff that's connecting in and out. Make sure you, you, you authenticate every single device uh, on, onto the system. You can see here, two of them were actually uh, clear text passwords that, that were actually used. And now, we had LogSec involved. <laughs> So if it's bad enough to have anonymous on your trail, you now have low, low sec uh, uh, in, in, in there. So that's two uh, in there. So there was large scale, uh, large scale data loss, and then Lizard Squad uh, went went after them too with a, a denial of service against the, the PlayStation Network. Drama Alert Nation, I'm your host, Killer Keemstar. Let's get right into this interview. I'm here with Lizard Squad. Uh, first question, guys, I got a bunch of you here. How many people are actually in Lizard Squad, official members? Um, there's not really like an official roster. It's more or less just whoever's affiliated with the group at the time being. It can be five to six, maybe seven, maybe less. Um, at the current moment, there's about five. Is there a, like, is, so I have everyone that's in Lizard Squad here in this call right now? No. Okay. Uh, is there a leader? Um, no, more or less, it's just people tweeting off the account. Um, some people do other things off the account and get tweeted on there. More or less, that's, that's basically what's happening. So for people, that, that, for people that don't know, what is Lizard Squad? Um, we are a Lizard Squad. We do what we do because we can do what we do. Other than that, we don't really know. Well, this is what I know. This is what I know, and I've seen uh, in the news and whatnot that you guys are responsible for. I know the Destiny servers went down. I know uh, that the PlayStation Network uh, went down. That it was DDoS. I know that there was a, an attempted uh, bomb threat, if you will, and a plane had to be rerouted of uh, of the CEO of Sony. Uh, that you guys took responsibility for. What else am I missing? What else have you guys done? Um, you're missing Destiny got down, Dota, you're looking at League of Legends, RuneScape, PSN, Xbox Live, Chase Medley getting on, Fame Gun getting on, Battle.net, WoW getting on, Steve-O getting on, Twitch.tv, the day of the Amazon acquirement. Yeah, today you just took Steve-O's Twitter account? Oh yeah, hashtag hack steve <laughs> Why, why did you why did you guys target Steve-O? Um, more or less, Steve-O was uh, kind of talking on the recent like leaking of all the news with all the celebrities, and uh, he was taunting, basically trying to trying to see if people could actually just you know blatantly hack into something, and uh, he found himself at the, the the losing side of that that whole ordeal. So Lizard Squad took the challenge. <clears throat> so, yes. Okay, so you guys have recently blown up. Um, I, I don't think uh, you were that well uh, known as a group or whatever until the Sony situation. Uh, now you have 55,000 Okay, so, the, so they've now got three the organizations on the back. That's, that's, a, that's a lot uh, to, 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 to cope with. So then uh, Lizard Squad uh, was involved uh, just at Christmas there. We uh, took down the PlayStation uh, network. The Finest Squad and Lizard Squad are the three groups right now that are um, going toe-to-toe -to -toe at one another. And I think that 
it's probably gonna we're gonna see like another group just randomly pop up to try and like take some fame fame sorry not fame uh, as like Final Scope for example they started out with everything you know, you know they were just trying to take the the Twitter fame and they couldn't do anything it's just a bunch of random people just uh, telling Microsoft to do things or telling Sony to do things that they couldn't do in the first place like whereas they were saying they tweeted out actually this quote unquote um, uh, this was on Christmas Day Sony and Microsoft um, you should have took our advice to prevent these attacks happening on Christmas Day but uh, how would Sony and uh, Microsoft take their advice like uh, they would have to offer well Sony and Microsoft would both have to offer their main servers to find a squad so Final Squad could try to um, secure them, which is almost impossible because the attack that was given was quite strong and it's almost impossible. So there are going to be other groups coming, I think. So the Anonymous just got involved with the Lizard Squad last night, actually, less than 12 hours ago. Okay, so you can see, you can see the problems the, that, that the logs they have there. So they got a whole lot worse uh, for them. So there was an email that was sent from uh, from this this organisation here uh, to the Sony, Sony executives, and it was ignored as spam, as phishing. <laughs> so all executives should really be looking at emails, and if something is 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 strange like this, would you take such an email serious? To be honest, uh, I, I I would I would, but they did they did send, and they did say that that they, they had already sent it. And we had the opportunity for this not to actually have happened. Uh, but CEOs should be trained uh, to be able to spot possibilities of uh, extortion. Happens with betting companies greatly. Uh, they are contacted all the time. So we will bring you betting. Because betting is probably one of the most high risk. If they bring a betting site down for a couple of hours, they could be losing millions. So they need to make sure that they're online all the time. So they, they're forever faced with people uh, saying we can take your site off if you don't pay us some money or let us win in the real head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it happened with the Guardians of Peace uh, there. So this was the message that uh, employees got when, when they logged into their computers on Sony uh, on that day. Five, three out of the five sites are actually Sony sites. They are, the data is contained on Sony sites. So it's not just external sites that they placed uh, all the stuff, they were actually in on Sony's own sites uh, from, from there. So the message said if you don't, if you don't sort of uh, uh, comply with our, our wishes by a certain time, uh, then, then we'll release the, the, the data from, from there. And so this is what's contained actually in, in, the, in the zip file that's actually there. So there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, information in, in there, all the strange sort of uh, documents in there. Uh, but this is, me, this is me listing the files that are on the, uh, on the, the, the system uh, from there. After about 12 minutes, my, my computer crashed while I was trying to record uh, all the files. This is a, this is a live uh, listing that, that I'm doing here of all the files uh, that are actually in there. I reckon, I didn't count them all, I used regex, but I reckon there's 26 million files, uh, file names uh, actually in there. If you name a movie that Sony has done, if you name a, a contractor, if you name an actor that's been involved with Sony, you actually find something in there. So it has account details, it has, it has business details, it has financial details, uh, and so on, all within inside uh, that. And one of the documents there uh, is quite quite strange documents. F facts behind the takeover of the U.S. is it's one of the documents that's actually in there. And a very strange narrative uh, in there uh, from the uh, from obviously the adversaries of, uh, of 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 Sony. But we could this just goes on and on uh, forever from from the listing. This is one of them here. So this is the this is the, the facts behind the plan take of the takeover of, of the US uh, in, in there. Along with this, there's a there's PPK files. Last thing you should ever lose from your site is your private keys. Okay, so don't ever leave your private keys under the plan pot because your private keys are the things that are encrypting 
for one, if you lose them, you're kind of stuffed because you won't be able to decrypt uh, stuff. If you've encrypted a movie with a, with a key, uh, then there, for others, then others can, can view the communications and, and the data and so on. Okay, so this is me listing the, the file, uh, and this file goes on and on. <laughs> this is, uh, this is quite, quite, a, quite a read, actually. A long, 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 long document was one of the documents that they, that they actually uh, left. There's a whole lot of links, links actually in, in there, uh, from there, but it just, it's actually very difficult to read the, the narrative uh, of, of it from, from there. Okay, this is one of them, and this is a very strange uh, document that's contained on it. This, it has a document that says there are there was the death of 50 CEOs within banks, of which one of them is an, R, is an RBS uh, CEO. I think he fell off a cliff, fell off a cliff. Very, very kind of strange. That was one of the, the one of the documents that was actually there's a fell off the cliff uh, actually there. And there was other strange graphics that were included uh, in, in the the bundle of the data that was actually left to them. Uh, that was one of the unfortunate ones there. And they also left a torrent uh, screenshot to show that they had uploaded the movies and all the files to, to bit to bit torrent. Uh, ignore the ignore the advert thing there, that's just that's just taken from a screenshot uh, from the from, from there. And this is one of the sites that, that uh, they had managed to take over. It was a Sony Pictures site, uh, but that contained the, the data. So it wasn't just external sites that they managed to compromise, uh, they also did it. This was another one, uh, a random Russian site that, uh, that, that had uh, open source software. That was also one of the, one of the sites which, which was included. And then there was, there, was, there was things around the criticizing the CEO of, of Sony. You see this is a long running uh, saga as around uh, the, the, the CEO. Uh, yeah. So if we look at the basic timeline uh, of it, it kind of kicked off at the end of, uh, end of November. And then uh, salaries of Sony Pictures executives was released and then other documents and so on were released. And then in the run-up to Christmas, we obviously had uh, uh, Kim Jiao uh, being pinpointed as, as possibly behind this because of the, the movie that, that, that was actually being made. And then we got the revelations around Angelina Jolie. And it was obvious that also the email, all the emails had been taken off the site uh, too. Once someone gets your post office, the PST, then it tends not to be encrypted uh, and you can read all the emails. So again, if you're looking at uh, protecting emails, you make sure that, that individual sensitive emails are, are, are encrypted uh, as, as part of your, your procedure. Okay, so there was a whole lot of uh, things in North Korea were saying that it was a righteous attack, but uh, they, they didn't actually see that they were, they, were, they were involved. And then it went on, obviously there was a problem, did anybody see the interview at all? Was it? Was the jailer? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't worth going to war, but that's 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 that, that's for sure. And it caused all the controversy and so on. And it's still seen that North Korea is, is being pinpointed as as the as the possible thing. But what might have happened? This is another. So through the next stage of the module, we'll be looking at all these mechanisms. So what could have happened was that uh, somebody just zipped up some files. Uh, or created a true clip to clip to volume and sent it off the network. We'll actually find out in, in the next in the next few lectures it's really difficult to detect such content leaving the site because it doesn't have a magic number, uh, it doesn't have content in it, it just looks like random noise. Anything that looks suspicious, like a zip file uh, or encrypted volume on a highly secure site should be dragged off the network immediately. And, and there is some investigation of it. So many companies have a, a, a place. Uh, users will get a message to say, we've, we've detected a zip file, uh, and we're not going to let it go unless you can see why you're actually sending uh, this file. The other thing is that uh, an SD card, the, the, the largest SD card, the largest capacity SD card on the market for the micro SD is two terabytes. 
So two terabytes uh, can sit at the, on the end of your finger uh, in there, and that can cause large-scale data loss. So you can virtually take all the data from many sites uh, th through one terabyte, eat it, go through some sort of checkpoint, and then obviously you could recover it a couple of days later if you needed And then there's then there's end-to-end -end tunneling, where someone can create a tunnel through the network and all your IDS systems and so on uh, will not be able to detect it. And one of the possibilities in Sony is that a sysadmin uh, in one of their offices uh, was an insider to it that maybe had some links to external uh, actors. Uh, and it was then that managed to get uh, the, uh, uh, the data off the site. So it's not proven yet exactly what it was. Another one would obviously be to install malware on the site that actually did the, did the data leakage. So the key, as we'll find in this part, is that we need to understand that data doesn't just exa uh, exist in one state. The three areas that we'll look at is data at rest on a machine, data in use, and that's in memory, and data in motion. Many systems now, the data at rest doesn't exist anymore, so you can now put your whole database in memory and many systems now have in-memory databases. So if you can get large enough memory, then the memory is, the data is actually stored in use all, all the time. So we're trying to understand how we can protect each of these stages uh, and make sure that we can detect the exception and make sure that everything is actually secure. Okay, so for us, uh, really try not to upset people, <laughs> really, as a company try to avoid any, any serious uh, heavy debates around political issues <coughs> and so on. Uh, and really, we'll see that SIEM and tools like Splunk are the, your eyes and, and ears. They are gathering all the logs from over the network. And even if you found that, that you have been hacked, you can play back a year or 18 months and actually see what actually happened so you can actually stop it from happening. So SIEM isn't just about what's happening now, because you've got three, three phases of a, of, a, of a security system. You've got before the event, which is your defense. You've got during the event, which is your critical incident. And you've got after the event, which is your forensics. And you can't, these days, you, you need to understand three main, main phases. OK, and it's often people that are causing the problem uh, and, uh, and, and not scripts and tools and things like that. They're easy to detect. People are really difficult because they're smart and they can do smart things. As long as people can create C++ code that can change things, then the, the walls be at uh, risk of them. So what we'll do is we'll have, a, we'll have a break for five minutes and then we'll just start back and we'll have a look at some regular expressions. Thanks. Uh, right, so, so we'll make, make a start. So we, we are interested in the, in the technical aspects uh, of, uh, of our data loss prevention. So we need to understand the mechanics of how we can actually create network sensors uh, and also on our systems to be able to detect when there is the loss of, uh, of, of data. So we're going to look at some of the fundamental areas and then also into how we can use regular expressions to be able to uh, build up uh, quite complex uh, patterns uh, for it. So we think about it, that's, that's what we focus on. I appreciate in, in, in some of the notes, I have A as assurance, A is availability. So we have confidentiality, integrity, uh, and availability as the, as the three core principles of, of what we're actually looking at. And then as part of that, our systems should have privacy in there. We should make sure that we respect the privacy of our customers. Uh, and also of our, our, our employees. We need some sort of access control and to make sure that, that uh, access to data and systems is carefully managed. And it's probably one of the key things in terms of data loss prevention is that accesses are always controlled uh, there. We need some sort of authentication properly uh, onto the, the systems. And then increasingly we need some sort of audit to make sure that we audit whenever someone has accessed something so that we have some uh, trace back 
uh, as to uh, when they did it uh, uh, and found that they're trying to breach our, our, our security policy. Along with that, we need to make sure that a user can't say it wasn't me, Gov, uh, I didn't do it, somebody took my IP address and spoofed it, and so on. So non repute I can't see the word, non repute can anybody see the word? Reputation. No. Reputation. Non reputation. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you cannot say it wasn't you that did it. So uh, if I access uh, a file system, then then if they have that log, that audit log, uh, I can't say someone must have accessed my account and so on. So non-repudiation, I got it. <laughs> non-repudiation uh, is, is to make sure that we can. And as we know, our logs are pretty rubbish. Uh, our Apache logs, our Wireshark logs can all be easily edited. Uh, Shipman, the GP, when, when he, he killed his patient, would go back uh, to his office, change the clock, uh, and then put the records in. Uh, uh, as if it was looked as if he, he had updated it before he actually met the, the patient. So Windows records and so on uh, really aren't as credible. So don't always think that what you've got is really what you what you should see. Corroboration is very important in these kind of things. I corroborate that you. I seen you uh, with CCTV. You entered the building at that time, and then I saw you logging into a computer. You know, so leaving the building and so on. So try to corroborate and cross correlate evidence whenever possible to make sure that you can see it. Because of this source, I also see this one. And again, SIEM is all about that. SIEM will tell you the whole story of what actually uh, happened. Okay, so those, those are, are really our focus on what it is what we're trying to do. Okay, so I'll bring this back again because this really allows us to really be able to articulate a security incident uh, carefully. A threat is achieved through attack tools for a vulnerability with certain access and results in something and it has some, some uh, objectives. So to understand data loss, it's important that you understand each of the, of the, the six areas and can uh, pinpoint exactly who it was, what attack tools they used, what vulnerability it was, uh, how they managed to access uh, what they resulted in. It doesn't do any good to just know that something has happened. You really need to know <coughs> what data has been lost uh, and, and when, it, when it happened and so on. And then we also have uh, uh, a basic ontology for defining our, our kind of security incident threat. May reduce an asset value of an asset and a target of interest uh, and, and, and so on. And then overall, it's, it's important that we define our, our overall system in terms of our security policy. So our security policy really defines what's allowed and what isn't allowed. And you don't really have much rights if you pinpoint somebody to say that you took that file off that site. If you can't pinpoint them to something in a security policy that says you are not allowed to access that or take that file off, off, the, off the system. So the security policy is really uh, defined through the aims of your, your objective, any audit compliance regime that you're, that you're fitting in with, a technical feasibility. It does no good to say I'm going to have a fantastic, amazing data loss prevention system if you have, if you don't have the things like uh, Cisco NetFlow that's really required for it. So the technical feasibility is important to feed into your policy and along with the moral, legal and social responsibilities. If a company detects a crime on their site, then they are responsible be able to report it uh, to, the, to uh, the, the authorities. So then we have our implementation, and that's a whole lot of things that should spin off. And the problem often happens is the disconnect between the policy and what's actually implemented actually on the system. You might have an amazing policy, but actually your implementation doesn't actually fit in. So it's important that you evaluate and make sure that your policy is working against the, uh, the definition. Then you verify it, some sort of internal audit. So internal audit shouldn't be you. Internal audit is somebody else doing some sort of assessment of your own system. Because you're never quite, you never do damage to your own system. You're always quite soft with it. I don't want to prove it too much. But somebody will be able to give a proper assessment uh, if they're 
extend them. And then eventually, increasingly, extend uh, auditors are coming in to be able to audit systems. And that's where you can be in serious uh, problems. Uh, if an external auditor comes in and, and finds uh, weaknesses in, in the system. Okay, and the policy is all about uh, really uh, many uh, different elements. We want to protect the system. <coughs> We want to try and audit, recover, react, log, and deter. And the recovery one is probably one of the most key these days, and that you want to make sure that your policy includes something around disaster and failover recovery. If you lose, if you have a major power outage in your uh, data center, will you survive? Can you rebuild it? Uh, where's your data? In many cases, it's the temperature. <laughs> It's the failure of the, of the uh, air conditioning unit that will actually cause a, a lot of problems. So don't always think it's IT type problems. A lot of it's to do with energy uh, and overheating uh, problems. So then you've got three elements of your policy. You've got your main IT policy, your general policy around your disaster recovery and business continuity. And we're shocked that many companies don't have business continuity. What happens if this happens? Who do we get involved? Where, do, where is our data? How do we get the whole thing uh, uh, back up and running? And then we've got our general user policy about internet usage and system usage and so on. And really that should wrap up all of your, all of your uh, uh, policy. And why? Why do we do it? Well, there's the big stick approach. So the big stick approach is that uh, we must do this because we must comply with these audit compliance reasons. In healthcare, we use HIPAA. You can't do anything unless you're HIPAA approved. Uh, and you can't really do anything in the financial market unless you're PCI and DSSSS. Uh, and also in the finance, uh, serving options is used extensively. There's a very, very, very high chance when you go for a job interview, you'll pick up one of those. So make sure when you go and visit companies for your interviews and you do serving options or you do uh, PCI, you read up on it to make sure as the kind of things. Because that's the big stick. You cannot trade as a company unless you do uh, one of one of these these things here. Okay, so so there's usually some some reason that uh, that we do security, but increasingly uh, companies are doing it because of IP loss. Uh, they're doing it for different reasons uh, and brand reputation and, and so on. So it's an easier sell now. Uh, banks will generally want to have trust with their customers and so on, and they don't want to be exposed to uh, data hacks. So increasingly there's an investment around brand reputation uh, and, 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 and data loss. Okay, so there's, there's some of the things that, that might, uh, might involve our, our data leakage, quite sensitive things. Patient information, of course, credit card details, and increasingly intellectual property. Somebody steals your source code or your, or your customer database and so on, then you're losing your intellectual property to uh, other companies. But it can also be around user activity, customer details, and even your system configuration. Uh, can be. And it's basically an accidental or unintentional distribution of private or sensitive data by uh, unauthorized uh, ent entities. So there's two different areas when we're assessing uh, the cost uh, of this. So there's direct losses, and direct losses are really looking at, uh, at any loss of customer, uh, uh, any loss of sales, litigation, which is sales and so on. So chief executives get that kind of thing, they can put a quantifiable effect. If I buy this new IDS or this new DRP solution, it costs me 30k. If I know if that hack happens, It'll happen once a year, and it's going to cost me half a million. That's a really easy sell. Half a million or 30k, and you, you decide uh, uh, what you want. In fact, you could go to jail if you don't do this. So that's a really easy sell. Where it becomes less is that they don't, they don't trust your figures. Show me the evidence. I've invested so much in this shiny new security equipment. I've invested a million. Show me that you've actually managed to catch people out and stuff like that. So more CEOs are actually quizzing these kind of things increasingly, uh, rather than just saying you need all the investment, they're actually looking for payback. What's my value add? What makes my company better than another company so that I win more sales and, and so on? It's the other side, it's the indirect losses that, that uh, are probably less tangible. 
Share price fall, company reputation, bad loss of faith with customers, loss of IP and brand reputation. And it's important to articulate that just as much as it will be to say that these are direct losses, these are the fines that we're going to get. And a company might say, that's fine, that's insurance. If I get fined, then that, that's OK. It's only this amount of money. Uh, but really, there's a whole lot that, of things that, that go along, along with it. So what are our solutions in, in DLP? Uh, really, we've got our standard DLP that we've got. We've got our firewalls, our IDS systems, our antivirus, and, and so on. And they all really work well. They're typically uh, focused on signature protection. So they're looking at creating a fingerprint and then finding that fingerprint. And hopefully you've all seen that that isn't great. It's not too difficult to breach a firewall or to trick an IDS. Metasploit does it very well because it puts, like, Hello World, it'll actually put Octo, H, and it put Hex, E, uh, and so on. It'll generally try to scramble. It, it, it deploys its, its uh, vulnerability as a, as a jar file with Java code and stuff like that. So it's a, P, it's a PK, it's a zip file that goes across. Uh, the sensors are looking for JavaScript. They're not there. They're actually in the JAR file, which is all wrapped up uh, in there. So the IDS is really struggling uh, to keep up with uh, all of these kind of things, because you can have an almost infinite amount of uh, ways that someone can get the malware into the site. So these are kind of, that's your first base type of the structure. You've got to have your firewalls and your IDS and your thin clients and so on, really as a starting point. And that's where you should start it as. The next thing you've got, your encryption and access control. Big fences <laughs> and big walls and having uh, restricted areas with inside an organization is probably one of the best ways that you can protect against uh, uh, security breaches. Strong device control, uh, strong access control in a, in a rights management system is, is, is important to that. And try to encrypt everything. So as I said before, when I get exam papers from Raw Holloway, I don't get them as paper anymore. I don't get them as a USB stick. I get them as a, as a PGP email message that's signed by, by my, that's, that uses my public key. Uh, and it's signed by Raw Holloway. So I can not only prove that nobody's read the exam papers, but I can prove that they actually signed that and it wasn't a spoof, uh, Raw Holloway and so on. So in a high school system, PGP and so on should always be used in, in, in encryption to be used for highly sensitive uh, uh, documents. And then you've got your DLP solutions. So your DLP solutions is looking at data in motion, data in use, <coughs> and data at rest. Don't ever think that you protect the data in just one of those states because once it pops its head off the encrypted drive, it's in memory. Uh, and more and more stuff is in memory all the time. It's not too difficult for someone to have a little look at the data as it's running in memory. C programs don't clean their feet after themselves. So it's all still there. Uh, a warm boot on a system means that it takes the restriction off and then it's still in memory. So many cryptography systems are breached. And there's a great one, I'll show you it sometime, uh, is that they take the top off the laptop and they freeze the chips. You know, you, you go to Maplin and you get the spray, they freeze the chips uh, and, and it doesn't, the memory doesn't decay. And memory will eventually decay, like a uh, dynamic memory decays <coughs> itself. Obviously, we use static memory in phones, but in dynamic memory, if you freeze the chips, then the, the bits on there don't change, they don't decay over, over time. Uh, and it's possible to get the encryption key back off of it. In fact, the sensors in the US managed to modulate the, the voltage on the chips and could actually find out what the encryption key was purely by uh, changing the, the voltage. It seems unbelievable, but if you modulate the voltage a little bit uh, on your chips, you can actually determine what the what keys actually are uh, on it. So the DLP solution really looks at, at, at uh, the three different uh, states and make sure that it's protected and sensed and detected. Many systems we've looked at has have automatic uh, encryption. It's, it senses a, uh, a protected document. You should always classify documents if possible and put metadata onto them. So this is highly restricted customer data. Your network sensors should detect that. 
and, and then automatically kick in encryption uh, for end to end uh, to the other side. And then there's the stuff, the, 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 the newer stuff. Uh, so we're doing work on zero day threat detection <coughs> uh, using uh, artificial intelligence methods. We work with a local company uh, and we're looking at how you can, you can uh, uh, discover threats. Uh, automatically, uh, just by analysing the uh, the malware as it, as it goes across the system. Areas like honeypots are obviously morally difficult. So with a honeypot, you have what what is, could be defined as entrapment. So a honeypot sits there as a shiny server, shiny system, saying log in to me right now. Here's an FTP server, or here's an email server. Why don't you just log in uh, and so on? So some of the, the more interactive honeypots will allow the user to log in and then take them through all the stages to make sure that they're committing a, a, a crime. <coughs> and it tricks malware quite easily because malware just drops into a honeypot and goes, yeah, yeah, I'm in the system, that's great, I found the email server, it's okay. Humans can spot a rat a mile away, it's a bit strange that this is an anonymous login for the main FTP service. There's something a bit wrong here. And the admin password is uh, 123456. This, this is a honeypot, isn't it? <laughs> so honeypots can be uh, uh, done in, in many ways. They're typically the dot two address or the dot one address in the network or the end address, the 254, because the intruder might find that one first, find what supports open and then drop into it. So with some of the honeypots that you use, you can get a Cisco device, you can get any device and it can look like anything uh, uh, at, at all. Kind of anomaly detection is kind of opposite from the signature detection. Anomaly detection is finding out uh, when things change. And for detecting humans, hacking, anomaly detection is the best. If you, what's the best way to detect fraud? Well, what do you think? If I, if I set up a system and I want to find out who's committing fraud in my company, what method do you think I might use? Was it? Take it? Profile based? Yeah, so you could do profile based. How would you do that? So you tap on everything you use along to you tell you open up. Yeah, you have a profile. So definitely so that the wrong spend is like a couple hundred pounds in this bed. That's it. Yeah. So when someone if someone comes in with a Ferrari, somebody comes to your company and they've got a Fiat Punto, and the next game day they have a Ferrari. They've either won the lottery uh, or there might be something. Somebody works late at night and on weekends and they've never worked like that in the past. That's the standard sign of fraud. Somebody who's starting working late at night uh, and working weekends and accessing the system remotely uh, and so on. So normally detection is really knowing what's normal in your network and what isn't. Unfortunately, for most of the tools that we've uh, evaluated in terms of anomaly detection, they don't work. <laughs> they don't work because it's a disparate, chaotic environment on a network. You might benchmark FTP traffic at 15% on a Monday at 3 o'clock, and then just all of a sudden it goes up to 100%. And, then you go, oh, boo -boo. and the last thing you want is alarm bells ringing, because all, the more alarm bells that ring, the less that you can actually see where the real threats are. So if you go around many of the SOC centers and you see many of the companies like Dell Secure Works and so on, you'll see they take trillions of alerts, they filter them down, and they filter them down, they filter them down, and they'll end up with 10 uh, at, at a time. So I'll show you some of the methods that they use in SOC centers to, to visualize uh, the, the network uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so those are our three areas that we really need to understand and we really need to detect and uh, assume that. So if we think about it, then we've got our what, where, how, and what, what's the actions. So what is it we're, we're detecting? So if we look at, at REST, is it a local machine or is it, is it remote? If it's data in use, if somebody wants to get data, can they get it? Like if they want to get patient data? Can you protect it? Can you protect it so much? You put so much cryptography on it. You lock down the browser. You disable copy and paste. You do everything. Can it still be leaked? Yes. Yeah, you can do a screenshot if you. Or well, we'll disable or that. Taking a picture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you can't win. Okay. So basically, you can't win. You'd have to gouge someone's eyes out, possibly. 
uh, to stop them. You viewed that document now, now graduate it. So you, you're not going to stop it. It's impossible because somebody can take a photograph of the screen and so on, someone can take a copy and paste and so on. All you can really do is to protect it to the end part and then hopefully there are mechanisms in place to protect the, the other bits, like no phones in the area, uh, no copying and pasting and so on. So you really need to understand uh, for data and use and uh, some of the things. And then for data and motion, our well-known pro protocols are lovely, they're well-defined. So most of the filtering we do now isn't at the TCP layer or the IP layer. They're not interesting anymore because people don't really stick to those ports anymore. If you want to find it port 21, it could be traffic. You'll probably find it could be tunneled through 8080 or it could be an encrypted 443 tunnel and, and so on. So the other ones is our unknown ones like our malware, our peer-to-peer. -peer. The ports are never going to alert. They're changing every time. Uh, so we need to understand understand those. And then where is it? Is it the end point that we, that we monitor or is it in, in the network? In a highly secure system, we're monitoring both uh, because we want to stop and detect early before we even get some codes. But stuff will go through the network quite happily uh, and then it's only when it gets onto the host that we can actually see it uh, in there. And then are we trying to prevent or are we trying to just detect? Okay. So I don't know if you've ever seen an IPS system and used in anger, it doesn't work that well. Uh, IPS systems, the, the human tries to take over, the machine tries to take over, tries to prevent, tries to reconfigure the firewall. The human knows how to trip it, how to do things wrong, uh, and it does all the wrong things. So IPS systems are often not switched on because nobody really trusts a machine to actually cope with all these disparate things uh, that, that goes on. So detection is normally what we use, and we've got some sort of content-based, we're looking at the tags, we make sure that all our documents are tagged in some way, uh, and we're trying to detect uh, 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 our content within there. And then eventually, what is it we want to do with our, with our if we detect data loss? Do we just want to mark it, do we just want to audit it, so that maybe sometime in the future we can go back to it? Do we want to notify the user, you've been bad, do you know you've sent a zip file at the network? Uh, or you've sent this really bad email, you have no rights to send that, that email, it had sensitive words in it. Or do we want to quarantine? Or, or do we actually want, even want to encrypt our data as it goes out automatically? Because the user hasn't done it, and we can't, we can't allow, we, users can't, would struggle with PGP and encryption and so on, and, and keys. So often on a network, we've got to do the encryption actually for them, and we make sure it's encrypted from our side to the, to the other side. Okay, so this is just recapping, hopefully, what you've done before. So this is our basic data formats. Uh, uh, our data doesn't appear as, as obviously a, a text. So it gets converted into uh, binary. The binary is interpreted in the NASCII format. Uh, if it's binary information, when we show the ASCII, it comes out as non-printing characters, so we can't see it. So we need some way to be able to view the data, and the way that we do it as humans is hexadecimal, uh, octal, or base 64. That's our representation uh, of, of, our, of our data. So as you should know, hex is you take four bits at a time, and you convert them to the hex character, uh, and so on. So for this one down the bottom, what, what would that be? in hex, starting from the left hand side. Which one? Hello? Hello? Is that hello? It's good to, it's good to determine that without even, <laughs> I don't have an asking table. What would it be in hex? Four? Okay, that's, that's a hex. That's how we represent that. 0x is what we normally re represent that. Or we can use octal. What would what do octal numbers start with? Like if you were to look at uh, like uh, Metasploit, if it was sending an octal character, what would it look like? With a, with a zero. Start with a zero. Okay, slash zero, 
is an octo, slash 0x is a hex decimal, uh, or slash x is also used for, for hex. And the good thing is you won't have to count up to 15, and we're fine. In octo, it's even easier, we'll have to count up to 7, uh, and that, that's it. So it's fairly easy for us to invert. The other one that we look at is basically 4, and you will see today that a lot of the data that you see on the line is a base64 format because it converts binary, non-printing, into printable format. So base64 is looking for 24 bits of a, of a width, and it will pad up to 24 bits. So we can see in the top example there, I've only went up to the one zero at the end, and I've padded the zeros, and I've still got a couple of places I've still got to, to fill in, so I've put in two equal signs. So we see the bottom one there, ABC is 24 bits. So it managed to fill the whole of the first 24 bits. So there are no equals at, at the end of it. Everybody can see that, that one. So it doesn't always have to have an equals in it. And the second one, I've taken ABCD. That's uh, 32 bits. So I reckon that's like, like five, six bits. So I'm up to 30. Uh, and then I've got two bits left over, so I'll have to pad uh, uh, the bits in there, and then it needs, needs to go up to the, uh, the 48 bits, so I've still got 16, which is two equals, uh, to, to actually go, go, go on them. And then the last one there, I've used the 40 bit one, and we're only missing uh, the bit at the end there, we pad with four bits, and then we only have one equal. So base 64 either has one equals, two equals, or no equals at all. It just depends how the, how the bits are actually laid out at, at, at the end uh, from them. But certainly when we're looking at our base 64, we would normally see uh, our, uh, see that there. And all our keys and all our encrypted our ciphers, if we, if we look at it, then they will typically be in, let me try and find where my keys are. Okay, so there's my, my public key. Create my public key. It's just in a, in a base 64 type format. And then the actual cipher itself. It doesn't have to be in a in, in a basic for form, on a, on a format, but if I want to send you an email, it's really easy for me just to copy and paste that into the body of the email, and then the system automatically parses between the beginning and, and, and the end of it. So in this way we can actually send, so we can see two equals at the end there, in, in, in this case, uh, for that. So, so base64 is obviously used, um, used extensively, and whenever you're looking for a bit of malware or a document, you take the copy of the B64 signature and not of the actual binary file. Because when it's sent as an attachment of an email, it will be sent in a B64 format and not of, a, of the actual core binary format. Also, our, our fingerprints are important, so we should always, if we're looking for a document, we look for a certain fingerprint of it. So we've got to take the whole of the document. The work we're doing here uh, is looking at, what's the problem? If I have an image, and if I change one pixel from red to green, what will happen to the hash? It will change completely, okay? You can't tell the difference. The work we're doing here is that we look at what are called fragment hashes. So we take a fragment of the document, and then we create a hash for that. So if we detect on one fragment, uh, that, that hash, and there's a very good chance that the whole document actually existed from there. There's also good work in what are called similarity hashes. So if I just change one pixel, I get a hash signature that kind of looks the same, that I can say, well, that actually matches with that. Unfortunately, that kind of work isn't sort of an, uh, applied in, in law enforcement. There are still many places that are still working on MD5 signatures, which are really compromised uh, uh, completely. SHA-1 and MP5 really should never be used anywhere. Uh, MP5 shouldn't be, but are good fun because <laughs> with the, with they have so many weaknesses as we've seen. But the focus for a lot of the, the 
data loss uh, prevention stuff is, is around uh, regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions are probably the best way to define the signatures that we're actually looking for uh, from there. Okay, and what we've got is the square brackets identify the range of characters that we're actually going to use. Uh, and the, the curly brackets identify the number of currencies. So we take the telephone number, the US telephone number, it's three digits followed by a dot or a hyphen, followed by another three digits and then four digits. Is that always going uh, is that is that always going to pinpoint exactly a telephone number? No. Uh, anything that what what other thing that, that might that that pinpoint? Yeah, so it could it could identify uh, an IP address or a bit of it, a fragment of it. So you find with regular expressions there's a really easy solution and then there's one that goes on and on <laughs> forever. That's a really precise one. Uh, the year, obviously it's the digits zero to nine, four times uh, identifies the year. We get a lot of false positives on that one. So in any idea system, it's the balance of true positives against false positives. If you have too many false positives, you don't trust the system anymore. Uh, uh, so you need to tune it exactly so that it, it, it has a good balance there. Email address, is that a good one for an email address? What's going to be the problem with the email address one there? Was it? First level? Yeah, it's only going to detect one character, so I could have Bill at A, and it's going to that, that would trigger that quite happily. It's not looking for .com or .uk or, or anything like that. It's looking for a dot, isn't it? It's looking for the... Just for dot. No, it could do the dot, yeah, but the dot doesn't have to be there. You, you all agree that the dot doesn't have to be part of the, the domain part then. Uh, so for our credit cards, then that's fine. Obviously the IP addresses, uh, we, we've got that. So I'll, I'll let you have a look at... Uh, the, the, the one I use is... Uh, is this one, which I really think is a fantastic. So, so I will try to get this on our security site or something like this, but I don't think I could even equal what these guys have actually done. This is, this is a really fantastic, uh, fantastic site. For I, I recommend this site uh, highly. I'll try and do something equivalent, but this, this site really does, does everything. I just love, love it as a... Uh, as, as a as an uh, analyzer. So, so just let me get some text and then we'll, uh, we'll just have a look at some of our regexes. Okay, here's my text I'm going to use. Let's stick that in there. Okay, so, so you're, you're, a, you're implementing a DLP solution. So tell me some of the sensitive things that are in that, that email. Email ID, credit card number. Credit cards. IP. IP. Mac address. Mac address. <coughs> password. Password. Websites. Websites. Phone number. Phone numbers. <laughs> 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 Everything. <laughs> postcode. <laughs> postcode. Postcode. Yeah. yeah. So imagine I'm giving away a postcode. It's really quite can be quite bad for some companies. If I work in a postcode company, uh, <laughs> and people are sending out postcodes and, and so on. So there are a whole lot of things actually in, in there. So what we need is is, is obviously to to look at our, our regexes that we can apply either to Snore or into Firewall uh, or onto our host host devices to be able to determine if we have some sort of uh, data loss. So I'll take I'll take the easy one first. So I'll just go for our our, our simple uh, email, and then you can actually see the problem with, with that one straight straight off. It's a great, it's a great one because it, I, I love the way it, it color codes uh, things. Uh, and the extensions, if you've done regular expressions here, what do they do? Uh, with G, the G. So our, our reg X will, will find the first one that you want. But if you do slash G, uh, then it, it, it does a global search and it will give you a list of, of uh, ones. So if you're using Python or C sharp or something. You do your regex. That's your regex string that you put in or snot. So you would go here, you would try it out first, 
make sure it works, make sure it works. <laughs> to a few people test their, uh, their solutions. Hopefully today we'll do some snort testing uh, on, on to make sure that things are working. But you can see there with this last G, uh, with that regex, it will actually be able to pinpoint uh, an, an email address. To agree that that really isn't a very good uh, 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 regex there for our email because it's it's going to it's going to fire off wherever we have something like uh, it, well it has done it there and that's not an email address uh, that's just that's just a, a, a domain a Windows uh, domain there so what we'll do is we'll get a get a better one and that's that's been improved one here hopefully just get that in there. And you can actually see this time. Oh, I mean, the, 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 so they've got published. So, so the, there's there are massive repositories of people putting in different uh, different regexes that you can actually use. And nobody would ever expect you to sit down and, and write that, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, it's good to be able to identify which ones actually work uh, very well. So you can see that one has worked much better. Uh, and even though we've got the global, it's not picking up the other, the other silly one that, that was actually there. So let's see if we can find our IP address. So our IP address is quite easy uh, to pinpoint. And you can see there, it's not been too bad. Not been too bad. What's this problem? Just pick up the MAC address. Just pick up the MAC address, because the MAC address can be a dot or a colon. Depends how you represent it. Some people will even put a little hyphen. Wouldn't, I think it, it, it wouldn't do it when the MAC address would have any characters in Any characters like uh, which ones? Like 1A, for example. In that case, it, it wouldn't do it. Yeah, so it's only when it's got numbers in there. Yeah, it's just looking for the entries. Yeah. So something like, like 2C, you're right. So it wouldn't. So I, I've cheated, I know. <laughs> I've cheated a, a little bit. Uh, from from there. Uh, okay, so that's 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 our and something. And then when we look at our, our telephone number, so that's it's a US telephone number. Obviously, if it was UK, it would be a a, a different one. Of course, that. You know, tell me what's wrong there. It's not working. <laughs> Because your pattern is not in the in the text. Yeah, so tell it's me not explain, working. Explain, explain. Uh, it's looking for three digits. Yeah, keep going. And a dash or a dot. And it's looking for another three digits, a dash or a dot, and then it's looking for four digits. Yeah. So what's the problem? Yeah. So if I change that <laughs> it's very well swapping, actually. Okay, so I've got my regex. Well, my regex was right, I think, for the US telephone number, but obviously uh, there's a little big telephone number. So sometimes with your regexes, you've got to do a few of them just in case there's a few different uh, things, things in there. So if we now look at our, uh, our, our postcode. So we've got two postcodes in here. So we can go for a very simple postcode, which is that one, and our postcode. Okay, so it's missing. Why, why is it missing uh, the? Why is it missing the other one? Because it's looking for a space. Yeah. If you delete the backslash or slash s. Make an or. If we want the, the problem with that one is that it will pick off others. This is the <laughs> this is the definitive postcode detector. <laughs> so if somebody has analysed this, and you know how you get SW1, and that's a really small postcode, and then you've got Edinburgh EH1, and uh, and so on Glasgow, and so on. Somebody has actually sat down and, and designed the proper regex. So you can see this one. This one actually works. 
because it will have you'll still get false positives, but it's un unlikely uh, uh, for, that, for that to happen. Okay, so you can get quite some quite complicated uh, ones that that, that will work uh, like that. Our credit card details uh, we've seen before, hopefully. So our regex will work, and you can see there is the PCRE format, that's the Perl kind of format, uh, but you also get JavaScript and Python and so on, C sharp. But they're all roughly the same. It's usually that you represent the slash with the double slash and so on. But they should work in, in Wireshark. We've seen if you use contains, sorry, matches, then we can use our, our regular expression in there. Uh, uh, if, if, if not, then we, we, uh, so we can see that, that one. That one is, is, uh, is, is what there for our credit card uh, details uh, for that one. It's not protected the other one. It's not protected the other one. Why not? So it's a credit card. What's it? For the card is for. What's that? Can you explain? It's 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 a different four or three digits. Yeah. So no, four. No, the card, the different cards start with different digits. Uh, so we get Master, American Express, Maestro, Switch, all these. Yeah. And this one's looking for the one that's actually four, yeah. so that's going to be Visa. Visa. And five is MasterCard. Freeze American Express, but I think it has different expression as well. It's not four digits each. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay, so you can see with that one, it's just, yeah, that one. Okay, so that, uh, that's fine. Uh, domain names, the domain names, usually quite easy to detect domain names because bit more difficult than, than, than it used to be. There's a lot more domain names actually in, in there. But that's certainly going for a com, an org, an net, military, edu, military, uh, US focused regex to be able to determine the name. Okay, then uh, our, our MAC addresses. Our MAC addresses, uh, we're looking for the, the, the hexadecimal characters in, in the basic sequences. Okay, so you can see it's picked off that one, uh, but it's not picked off the other one. The reason for that? Start individual. Yeah. Start. It's not that it's okay, but it's obviously the uh, the, the delimiter character that we've, we've actually used uh, in the EB, uh, EB has something similar to that. You can't send email addresses to a private message. So you can't send email addresses to a private message. Uh, so those are the kind of scanners that are there. Every email is scanned and it will pick off. Yeah, if you send it, if you send it to the central level, so I would say, so yeah. I'll buy something out of eBay to pay for it. So yeah. I say, well, he says, well, he's going to get it cheaper, so <laughs> just send it with a different message. Is that messages. it? Okay, and then the last one. The last one, uh, it's just really trying to... <laughs> <laughs> Trying to identify uh, the password sequence of, 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 of characters there. Okay, so we'll be doing doing a lot more regular expressions in, in the lab, uh, and really try to get used to them uh, because they they are often used fairly fairly extensively in, uh, in, in security uh, and setting up and, and getting sensors. To go to detect uh, certain things, but there's no guarantee because uh, uh, the tunneling and encryption can actually happen. So in the next lectures, we'll be looking at uh, how we actually detect tunnels. We'll go into really a, a lot of detail into the negotiation of the tunnel because that's really what you want to be getting into. You want to understand uh, the tunnel and how it all happens. So hopefully, uh, you've done the crypto stuff already. So we'll be able to dive in. We'll be looking at disk encryption, especially around uh, BitLocker. And uh, BitLocker has 95% at least of the market. It's a Microsoft product that we have virtual monopoly. We'll also be looking at TrueCrypt, uh, which is, a, which is uh, an open source uh, system from there. Okay, does anybody have any questions at all? We've covered a lot today. <laughs> Cover a lot in the lab today. We use NetWitness in the lab today. Uh, we'll be able to go get our Wireshark traces, analyze them with Snort, and then what we want to do is extract the artifacts.
from the Wash app tray. So today we want you to be able to dump your PDFs and the GIF files and all the documents from your Wash app trace because you really need that for your coursework. <laughs> okay, so in the coursework we're nearly there, the crime scene has been set up and all the bad things have nearly happened. Uh, we'll give you some complex Wash app traces to investigate. It's up to you to be able to extract all the artifacts, find out what happened and then crack any codes that are actually in there. Okay, any questions at all? Um, you, with, your, with your password for reg eggs, you cheated. I did. I did. Yeah. 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 Yes, you cannot, you cannot trace a password. You can. You can. I, I, I know that. I, I did cheat. I cheated a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Passwords are really quite predictable. Uh, if you ask somebody to put uppercase, they always do the first letter. If you ask somebody to put, to put a number, it's always at the end. So in things like John the Ripper, you can actually optimize it so that it knows. Yeah, but uh, it's always a good idea to use a password generator so you can do that stuff. Yeah. Okay, I cheated, I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I left that one to the end, so you didn't see it. <laughs> okay. Just looking for six characters. So I'm I'm the on, on, when I see you in sight, I'll, I'll add in a reg X, but I can't do it better than that site. I mean, that's, that is just always my kind of thing. Good that one. Well, thanks very much. We'll have a nice time. We'll have a nice time in London. Thank you.